11 weeks semester of 2023, UGRC 150, and this is Monday group one. You are dealing with Dr. Nancy Miles, a group instructor, and also currently the coordinator for UGRC 150. Welcome. We have gone through good content in the course so far. This unit is quite crucial, and I'm glad that a subsequent uh, 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 previous discussions referred to it a lot, made some references, uh, practical references, as well as some methodological references to the unit. So finally, finally, that simply means finally, finally, we have launched into the unit that I said is substantive to reasoning. See that we are doing critical thinking, practical reasoning. And so far, we have looked at language, you know, ambiguity, equivocation, declarative, imperative. Those were all basically language and it is. We have now launched into the reasoning part, the argumentation, evaluation, examination part of the content. Okay. And that is what I would want you to focus on now. And so the unit is deduction versus induction. And we hope that we can do a lot with today. I will definitely have to move on to the same content subsequently. What should you know in the session? In this session, we learn two different ways of reasoning to offer justification. Look on my screen, please, for conclusions drawn. We are going to look at two ways of offering justification for the conclusions that we draw. The two ways of reasoning I have in mind here are what deduction and what induction. We will learn that each of these two types of reasoning employs what different principles of dependability and credibility. All what I'm seeing is on the screen. Whereas for one, we can depend certainly on the pattern of reasoning and we can credibly mm, accept the conclusions drawn for the other, it is only a matter of what degrees of confirmation or probability. One gives you a certain level of what certainty. One is question of certainty, the other one is a question of probability. Deduction is induction. Now on the screen you see one is more concerned about the pattern, the form, the structure of thought, whilst the other one is actually concerned with the content of that thought, content. So deduction deals with pattern, structure, form, and so has a certain sense of certainty with it. Whereas induction deals with what? Content, subject matter. And therefore, it's a question of probability and not certainty, okay? What should you know as ingredients, a starting point, session outline? You should know how to contrast deduction or if like deductive reasoning from inductive reasoning. Know the two types of argument we have studied earlier. Remember, unit three, when we discuss types of discourse, did verbal, uh, excuse me, after doing verbal dispute substantive disagreement, we saw types of discourse, narrative, extraction, et cetera, you remember. Then we go to argument as a type of discourse. And then, then, then I introduced you to two types of arguments and told you put that in the fridge for future use. Here we are finally, okay? So just refresh our memories on how those two types of arguments are. We'll find some examples to buttress it. The rest will be practiced. I'll look for some other slides and some other more examples. Beep it up if we need to, or you would even give me more as students to help us work together on understanding 
deduction and induction in practical terms, use an example. Okay, and then what? And then second thing you should note over there on the outline, we will look at correct and incorrect ways of distinguishing deduction from induction. It means that there are incorrect ways of doing that. People have incorrectly distinguished the two. We want you to do it correctly. So we'll look at it. The point about deduction being topic neutral is key. It is not interested in the subject matter. So you can put in variables where you are deducing. All P's are killed. This thing is a P. It has to mean, therefore, that it's a Q. Because deduction is not really focused on the content proper. So all human beings fly. Our lecturer is a human being. She must fly, or it must fly, whatever it is. She, mangoes are elephants, and elephants are dogs. Then it will mean that mangoes are dogs. So deduction is neutral to the topic. That's why we can use variables to even represent the deductive pattern, and it will not lose its work subject matter, or it will not lose its work, validity, etc. But you can do that with induction. By reasoning inductively, uh, it is content-based. We look at the relationship between statements. If you say most or all, are you talking about human beings or you change it to animal? You know, when we are reasoning inductively, we look out for that. Those are key to the outline. And what else should you know? By the end of the presentation, you are supposed to know particular statements and how they differ from general statements. And the key thing to help you do that is identifying reference class and distinguishing it from attribute class of one statement when you have it. Remember the pinendum and the pinions in definitions? Yes, there's something around that when you say reference class and attribute class of a statement. Just like if we're doing English, we we'll talk subject and predicate. That's all. So even in the outline, you should have a fair idea of what is helping you to look out for a statement that you will call particular versus the one that you will call general. What will you look at? You are being ad advised to look at the reference class and see how it relates or differs from what the attribute is. We'll see it shortly. Then you, you know types of generalizations, universal versus what statistical. These are just things you can use one slide to talk about. I just want you to see that you will cover all these in one discussion, one lecture. There are not many, but there are particular details that if you are not helped to focus on, you will overlook. And then when you are called to give an account of yourself, it will look like it's a bit. Okay. So take note, types of generalizations will be captured. We will tell you that when you have a universal generalization, it is actually a disguised conditional. The conditional statement in disguise. A conditional is an expression that has a condition attached to it. If you wash my car, then I'll give you 10 grand, for example. It's a conditional statement. But I may say the same thing without using if then. The, the expression if so and so, then so and so. So I may say, whoever washes my car gets 10 Ghana. It is another way of saying the same thing. But if you wash my car, then you get 10, 10 Ghana. So I could present it both as a universal generalization or as a disguised conditional, and they are the same. In that is where you will be able to tell the antecedent and the consequence. If clause, if you wash my car, then I give you ten grand. So then, you washed my car, which is the if clause. She is the antecedent. What must happen for another thing to follow? If you study, then you will pass. So you study becomes the antecedent. You pass becomes the consequence. See that. Even in the introduction, that is clear. The rest will be more practice. 
which tutorials are there to help you do and constant practice is there to help you improve. We also know how to think of what? Negation, how you should understand negation. All those will be covered there. Then the third major thing this presentation will give you will be the four valid logistic patterns. Those ones I am confident in the class, generally speaking, that we have. These are level 100 who have done, you know, statistics, uh, whatever, uh, how do you put it? Uh, substitution by elimination, what have you, more difficult stuff, if you like, in SHE. So this will be relatively accessible to the majority of you. But we'll be there to look out for those who are not too, you know, analytic or analytically inclined, they're not a mathematical or if you like, whatever type. And so we we'll patiently walk the class through it to get the four valid patterns of the logism that you have in your text. Modus ponens, modus tollens, disjunctive syllogism, and hypothetical syllogism. And at this stage, I'm so glad that the microphone is stable. <laughs> and I'm doing a monologue, so you can laugh at home or <laughs> at home, and that's fine. Okay, but you will see before long that you will be the one helping me to stand at the end of the lecture. Of unit six is two in one, so we do we we'll do as much as we can to be without ration at all, and then build up subsequently to complete the lecture. For by the time we end in this lecture, you will know modus ponens, which has a surname. I always say that affirming the antecedent. You will know modus tollens, which has a surname, which is what negating the consequence, or if you like denying the consequence. You know this junctive syllogism and hypothetical syllogism. Then see what else is on our menu for unit six on deduction versus induction. You will now learn some formal fallacies. The word fallacy is not something to be proud of. So take note, remember unit one, lecture one, introductory lecture, fallacy, error in the way you are reasoning, the problem associated with how you are reasoning. Here, it is problem with the form, the pattern of the structure, the pattern of deduction you are making is what we find fault with. Not informal fallacy where we say you are appealing to the masses or you are attacking the person, say, put a pony on my forehead. You know, all those funny, very interesting examples I gave. Those were informal. They are not really about a rule of thumb concerning how you do your deductions. No. But the one we see on our screen, which will engage us in, in Unit 6, are fallacies associated with how the person is doing the deduction. So you have been given some premises, like you have a password on your phone, you slide it to create a Z to be able to unlock it. Then someone is trying to do the Z, but turns it upside down. It, the phone won't unlock. And so the problem is not that the phone is sick or something, but the pattern of deduction is not being obeyed properly. It looks like it, but it is not being done well. And so it is a fallacy of the form. That's what those ones we look at closely in the unit. So the correct patterns are the ones up there, modus ponens, modus tollens, disjunctive syllogism pattern, and hypothetical syllogism pattern. Those are the correct ones, but we'll see incorrect patterns imitating the original so much so that you are tempted to think they are the same. That's why they have gone ahead to have their own name. So look at the original modus ponens. It's called affirming the antecedent. Someone is trying to do modus ponens, but does it wrongly, okay? Doesn't follow the pattern of affirmation properly. If you want to affirm to create modus ponens, you have to affirm the antecedent. Look up on my screen. But the person will rather go affirming the consequence and that becomes a fallacy. So you don't call it a modus ponens fallacy. No, modus ponens is not a fallacy. So you can't say modus ponens fallacy. You will be wrong. That fallacy's name would be affirming the, the consequence. 
because it didn't affirm the antecedent, it rather affirm the consequence. That's its name. The other one, trying to do two lines, doesn't do it well, negates, but rather negates the antecedent. And then the other one in your text is the false hypothetical syllogism. All these will have flesh to it when we delve into the content problem. But it is important that you always have a good skeleton, a good frame, a good plan of the building so that when people are watching you carry more water and water, which you are working with, they can understand why the foreman says, take three concrete uh, you know, mixtures to the top here. Take it. They should have a fair idea of what you are doing. Then everyone can feel the part of it. So from start all the way to finish, we we'll use some good time to show you that the final content for you as prepared for you will then look at what? Valid argument and sound argument. Excellent. As the outline, very detailed to help you focus so you don't miss important, important uh, topics or important matters of the unit. What is the required reading of the session in the space of the test? Very good. Now I think I can pause and then we will do the cooking of the meal together. Look when it is finally done. Raise your hand if you want to do the reading for us. I just, I'm going to allow the microphone only because I want us to have a very good interactive session onwards. You play your role fine, you do beautiful class time for your benefit. If you disturb too much, and I don't like putting that in the recording, because there's a few people that may have that challenge, then I'm forced to have to lock up and then only unmute a few. It's not too pleasant. Hello, who has the honest please? Oh, yeah. thank you. Deduction versus induction. These terms describe two types of arguments, two ways of reasoning, two ways of supporting a claim with evidences. Deductive arguments. In a valid deductive argument. If, if you have, no, please, if you have uh, an earpiece on, remove it and let's see if it will be clearer. It's a bit blurred. I don't know if yes, blurred is the right word. These terms describe two, two ways of reasoning, two ways of supporting a claim with evidence. Deductive argument. The value deductive argument. If the premises are assumed to be true, then the conclusion is also necessarily true already. Inductive argument. The conclusion may not necessarily follow or may not be true, even Very if good. the premises are assumed to be true. Recall premises and conclusion. Well done. Thank you very much, sir. Now, everyone Thank listen you. to me. Your friend read very well. There is no struggle with this content. I want to caution no complacency. Don't lose attention for anything. Okay, let's finish this. You can do all that you want to do later. Because if you get some very simple basic things, then the rest of the discussion flows for you. This is reasoning. It's not just language like we've done so far for the past five weeks. So just a caution. So right, if you take it flip, flip, flop, flip, flop, you'll struggle because it is content that is relatively heavy but accessible to you if your posturing is right. Your friend read that there are two ways of reasoning or arguing. That simply means in simple terms, two ways of giving evidence to support the claim you are making. Whenever people say things, remember argument in our premises and conclusion. You are saying something, that's the conclusion, and you give us reasons why we should accept or reject what you said. Now, sometimes 
when you give us on on my screen please everyone keep looking i just helped you recall argument that's what i projected now so if you can see then please let's do that together keep looking don't get distracted at all okay now I said so if i gave you reasons why oh i think she stole the laptop we say why you see because she was the last person who left yesterday that is an argument if you put it together it will be since she was the last person who left the room yesterday then she stole the laptop so i projected an example of that on the screen example three since the security man was the last person who left the building yesterday he stole the project leader's laptop the person speaking wants to say the security man stole the laptop of the project leader that's what he wants to say conclusion his reason or her reason is what the security man was the last person who left the building yesterday our issue is if we were to accept it to be true if that's what elom read i'm taking us back to elom's reading remember look at the if capital i f for emphasis if the premises premises here referring to what reasons evidence that's the technical word for premise we learned that earlier if the premise the evidence i'm giving they may be two or three they may be one so if the premise i offered were assumed to be true if we took it to be true if we took it to be true that who is stressing the sister there my sister your mic is not muted though so if someone doesn't know they will misinterpret it to mean that you were addressing us because i want to believe that it is not us so deborah jimfi mute your mic why mute it or goldie uh -huh. Goldie just did. Okay, and we continue. Don't get distracted. Maybe Spokuya, mute your mic. I don't want to disable it because you may really need help that I have to assist you. Then now your microphone is disabled. Why? So keep them muted. Everyone check just in case your mic is on. Mute it. I will try and mute it along. Pascaline, very good. She just muted. Well done. So we move on. Back to where I was. I just said. If it were true, if it were true that the security man was the last who left, we took that to be true. It has not said it is true. But if we were to grant it to be true that he left the building last yesterday, does it necessarily mean that therefore he stole? The laptop back to our understanding of induction versus deduction the answer is no not necessarily we can accept it to be true that he was the last person who left the room it doesn't necessarily mean we have to or we are obliged to also accept that therefore he stole the laptop that is why the reasoning the argumentation here is induced and forcing the conclusion out of the premise. I'm forcing it. Induced vomiting. Apologies. Someone has taken in poison. You can give them palm oil and something to force out vomit to save the person. This one will force you are forcing <laughs> the conclusion out of the premise. It is not part of it. You are forcing it. The person didn't say they want to vomit. You are forcing it. Okay. So the same thing is happening in our example two on the screen. If you follow me, I believe diligently like you are doing, you will get this like fingertips back and then you will pass and get 98%. That's what we are looking for and graduate and continue with your departmental course to become whatever God has ordained that you be. Okay. We don't want you trailing with Dada, Father, Emmanuel, blocking our path when we are passing. Ima, Father, Dada. You know them? E, F, E, F, no. So listen, and I'm glad you came soon. 
Now, so the second example is on your screen. Most Ghanaians are hospitable. My mother, she's hospitable. My question to the class, and I won't disable microphones because I want to hear you on this and make sure we are covered. Tell me, am I necessarily obliged to say that because look at the first premise, most Ghanaians are hospitable. The second premise says, my mother is a Ghanaian. So I have concluded that therefore she is hospitable. We all see that it is inductive, meaning that the conclusion does not necessarily follow from the premises. Why? Because it is possible for us to accept the premises as true, and we are not necessarily required to accept the conclusion that it came with. Why are we not obliged to accept the conclusion that, uh, where is it? Therefore, she is hospitable. Let me hear from you if you want to make a comment. Raise your hand. Because we already have a label that it is inductive. Most Ghanaians are hospitable. I want to enlarge it a bit more. Okay. Look at that example. So there is no confusion. Look, most Ghanaians are hospitable. My mother is a Ghanaian. Therefore, I conclude that she is hospitable. Is the conclusion certainly the case, granted that the premises were true? If we took the premises to be true, will it necessarily mean the conclusion also? No. I hope that is the answer that the hands that are raised sought to say. Not necessarily. Because we said most. And most doesn't mean all. So even I, if I took what you said to be true, that most Ghanaians are hospitable, because most Ghanaians may not be hospitable. Yeah. But we are not saying that is actually true or actually false. We are saying if, if, if. So remember Elam. Elam read it. If it were true. Senkeya no Korea. That what? That most Ghanaians are hospitable. That's first premise. Second premise. And that it were also true that my mother is Ghanaian, Krampwa. Because my mother may not be Ghanaian. But let's grant it that if it were true, that most Ghanaians are hospitable and my mother is a Ghanaian. We took these two premises to be true. How do we know that they are premises? They are the reasons being offered for the conclusion. Look at that. The conclusion is therefore. So hence, that's as a result. Back to I, that slide that has those examples. I projected it earlier. So the person's con And what are her reasons? Oh, because she's my mother. Eh, she, eh, she, she's my mother who is a Ghanaian. And most Ghanaians are hospitable. Now, if we even took those evidences, all of them to be true, we already see that it doesn't necessarily mean that therefore she's hospitable. That is what makes this reasoning or argumentation for inductive, not like the next one that we are going to look at. So I've showed you just two so far, this one, Inductive argument one, since the screeching was the last person, blah, blah, blah. And I just added this very explicit, unambiguous, so that you don't struggle to get the main thing. Then now I increase the level of difficulty. Now, what about this other example on your screen? And I want someone to read. I've labeled them. The answer is already there. So no worries about trying to find the answer. It is deductive, but why? That's what makes for understanding. So I want to read that quickly. Uh, Elon, please, you can continue for us until. Okay. Um, exams. Amma is a student, so write exams. Very good. All students write exams. Amma is a student, so she writes exams. Joanna Ajua Edu. Suppose. We assumed that these two premises were true. Here again, there are two premises leading to a conclusion. That's what syllogism means. It's simple. We'll get to that slide, but I'm taking it off your shoulder. Two premises. 
two evidences, eh? but let's use the technical term now, two premises leading to what a conclusion in a valid deed action. When you have that, we call it a syllogism. So modus ponens is a syllogism. Modus tollens, which we'll study, is a syllogism. Hypothetical syllogism, it came with a name. It's a syllogism, and so is disjunctive syllogism. All the four valid deductive patterns that we'll study are all syllogisms. So we we'll take it off. Now back to where we are. All student write exams. My lady, you answer shortly. Am I a student? Look at those two premises. If we were to take these two premises to be true, will it necessarily immediately by, by force, at once by force, immediately, immediately <laughs> require of us to also accept the and why? Please go ahead. I mentioned my, my lady's name. If she's not ready or she wants someone to assist, then let's have favor. Are you able to help us? Favor. I don't know if it's better or better. Apologies, but it's favor. Okay, let's take Trinibua, Vera. I think some are. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead, my dear. Go ahead. Okay, madam, the ease of the all. It doesn't exempt anyone out. So, am I supposed to exempt? So, she writes. Excellent. That's the answer. Look at not just the all, like Madame Favor correctly pointed out. She tells us, look, the person speaking said all students write exams. Then she added an additional information. The person says all students, none of them left out. That includes student of yesterday, student that died 100 million years ago, student born today, student that will be born 100 million years ahead. Hey, I'm teaching you something else. So don't lose track, I've said. I teach by the grace of God with grace and experience. <laughs> so by the time we get to a certain slide, you see that we have dealt with it. I'm teaching universal generalization here, here and now, without you crying over. Listen, the person said all students right is that, and it was your sister favor who made the point. I'm just learning from her. And I have a long mouth, apologies, eh? So I'm elaborating. But it came from you, the student. She says, ah, but talk. The person used all, didn't leave anybody out. So if that is it, yeah. Then, so I picked that and I'm using it to show you deduction and even expand your knowledge further to help you ahead on what? Universal generalizations. So follow me, don't lose track. You know syllogism now, even though we have not reached syllogism slide yet. And that is how you learn. All right, so I said, sister says, all students write exams. That includes students of all times, all places, born, dead, buried, 100 million years ago, alive now, those that are yet to be born. That's what you mean when you say all women are like that. All men are like that. When you speak that, we are speaking for all times, all places, without exception. Are you God? It has a tone of what? Infinity, infinite. You are not exempting anybody. So we call it a universal generalization. You are not only speaking in general terms. Your generalization doesn't make any exception to the set. You're not leaving anybody out. I'm talking for everybody for all times in that set. That is the problem. Women are this. Tables are that. Green tables have done this. Brown tables have done that. Brown tables of all times, all places. That is the tone of your speech. So we call it universal generalization. That has a saying. It is also called law-like generalization. It is like a law. The law makes no exception. The law is no respecter of persons. So if you don't hear universal generalization, you will hear law-like generalization. And it is talking about this way of speaking. All mangoes are fruit. 
whenever you throw a ball up, it will come down. Students cheat. That's saying all students cheat. Metals expand when heated. Women deliver in nine months. Remember the normative versus the empirical, the laws that we do. They are all universal or law like generalizations. Okay. You know that you put it down, put it in the fridge, we'll pull it out and use it to do our dessert after the banquet and we are preparing now. Okay. So put it in the fridge. Now back to where we are. Madame then, El, Madame Elon, hey, I'm sorry, is it? No, Madame Favor mentioned this and said, Doc, because the person speaking set off with what? Uh, and all, he said, all students write exams. Then look at the second premise. Not that because we saw all 90, we have been carried away, we think it's deductive. No, look at what is happening. What is happening where? Between the premises and the conclusion, there is a relationship be existing between the premises given and the conclusion drawn to argue. The person is arguing, giving you evidence or premises to ground a conclusion that he or she is making. So it is the connection between the two, the inferential relationship between those two parts of the argument that determines whether it is deductive or inductive. That's what we are looking at. So first of all, Madame Favor has looked at the fact that we set up with an all statement, all student write exams. Then look at what is said next. Amma is a student. That is very, very, very important. That is what names the type of deduction going on. So look at it. Got it. What is happening is a deduction, but we'll see shortly. And it's even a certain type. You said all oh, students write exam. What you said next is that Amma, you are dealing with a particular person, Amma. And you say she has done She is a student. I didn't say Amma writes exams. That would have changed the argument. It would have made it invalid immediately. So the second premise is crucial. And Favor took notice of that. She says, they said Amma is a student. Now, you know something about all students. And we are taking it to be true. Because it may not be true. Some students don't write exams. They just do a defense. So it may not necessarily be actually true out there that all students write exams in pool. All right? But we want to say, suppose it were true that all students write exams. One. The second thing is, look at what she's saying. Amma is a student. Then what you know of all student people will be true also of Amma. So I could have just given you the two without the conclusion, like I've done on my screen, and said, if it were true that all students write exams, and it is also true that Amma is a student, then what conclusion can we necessarily draw from these two premises? You will see that it will have to mean then that Amma writes exams. By the logic of it, so if it were true, I'm going to give you another example, that all men like rich, no, no, all women like rich men. And my ladies, apologies, eh? I like examples that are not difficult to remember. Then you laugh. <laughs> rich is so the only bad, eh? It shouldn't be your only target, but it's important. Don't do, oh, 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 love, love. It is important. Love without money, you struggle too much, sister. It will be endurance, not enjoyment. So it's not bad. Just that don't make money, 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 money. I want to, you can get money and then you can enjoy. All right. So back to our discussion. All women like rich men. Write it down because you are going to give me the valid deduction by some divine, a divine machination. You will give me prophetic <laughs> direction. Right now. All women like rich men. Ajua is a woman. Should I start again? All women like rich men. That's my first premise. Ajua is a woman. What 
will necessarily follow if these premises were true. And here, I want people to breathe a little. So unmute your microphone and respond. What would be the valid conclusion? Because I couldn't hear. Okay, all no, women, no, no, no. you are, say it again. First premise, all women like rich men. That's the first premise, okay? Second premise, Ajua is a woman. What conclusion necessarily follows? All of us. So she likes rich So she likes rich men. Ajua. So she likes rich men. So Ajua likes rich men. So she 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 likes very good. Everybody has done well. Sometimes I allow that. It helps me to get feedbacks and know whether the, the impact that has to be made with that very important content has been made. And I think generally it has. You would even be safer without using the pronoun, use the name. So Ajua likes rich men and everyone got that. You will be amazed at what you have done. You didn't only show that that reasoning is deductive, but you have even been able to do one of the very deductive patterns that you are to study, modus ponens. But I will show you that that is what you've done. So you, you have some confidence inside that. Yeah, I don't only know deduction versus induction. I know modus ponens. That's what you've done. Now, I didn't have to give you the conclusion. I gave you the premise or the premises, but because the reasoning is deductive, you can deduce the conclusion from that premise. So the premise is like the pregnant woman, fully pregnant, I mean, with a baby in the tummy. If I asked her to come into the room, that is if I accept the pregnant woman into my room. That is to say, if I accept the premises, which is the pregnant woman, as true, I cannot say that, why have you come into the room with the baby? Take the baby out. If you say take the baby out, the, preg the pre pre pregnant woman will go out also. The conclusion is the baby inside the pregnant woman, which is the premises. That's the relationship between deductive premises and their conclusion, where the deduction is a valid one, okay? It is a necessary connection, not a probability. It is a necessity. That is why I didn't give you the conclusion. Look at how large the class is. I gave you only the two premises, but by the way they are connected, if you accept the premises as true, you have already, it's not now that you're going to think about it, you have already accepted the conclusion to as true. They came with you with the premises. That's what happened. You just have to open the premises and the conclusion will reveal itself. And there you go, voila, you will see the conclusion with it. Anytime it rains, the grounds get wet. It is raining right now. Obviously then it will mean, deductively speaking, that the ground is wet, shall be wet, is getting wet. <laughs> the tenses don't matter. That's why we will be using variables, remember, deduction is neutral to the topic. So we can even say, if P happens, then Q will follow. P has happened, therefore Q. We are using variables now and the pattern is not failing. Now, what then is deduction? A reasoning pattern or an argumentation argument whose premises, if true, would necessarily mean the conclusion must also be true, else you create a contradiction. So let's go to a slide that captures that beautifully, and then we can make some good progress. I want, uh, was it favor? Yes, favor better. Is it better or better, my dear? Read for us, correct distinction between deduction and induction. Is it better? I don't want to pronounce people's names wrongly. My name is better. Better, very good, go ahead. 
deductive argument. Deductive argument. An argument is deductive when the truth of the premises guarantee into brackets proves the truth of the conclusion. In a, in a good valid deductive argument, if the premises are assumed to be true, then the conclusion must be necessarily true. In a valid deductive argument, it is impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false at the same time. That will create a contradiction. Very good and well read. Now, before I go to the wrong way of uh, distinguishing the two, let me see if there is a... Uh, the point then is this. If you have a valid deduction, because I've told you, I've given you a hint that will show you sometimes deductions that have been wrongly done. So you can have an invalid deduction. And we'll show you instances that they are the ones we are called formal fallacies. They are fallacies of the form, error of the form. Okay, so the person is deducing, but instead of bringing the right side before the left, you bring the left before the right. And those are the ones we we'll call antecedent and consequent and what have you, that we want to take it slowly so you don't choke. But you can eat the whole plate full of rice. We are sure about that. Just that you can carry the bowl and, and pour in your mouth like you will choke. So I'm going to give them to you slowly, antecedent, consequent, what have you. But where we have reached so far is what? that if you do the deduction validly, that is correctly. So Madam read it, she said in a good, that is in a valid, this is not good of judgment, value judgment, where you say, well, good and bad is point of view. So we tell you what we mean by saying it is a good deduction. That is when you deduce validly, you do it in the correct way. Hmm? What will it mean? It will mean that if the premises are taken to be true, then the conclusion will necessarily be true also, or must be true also. It is not possible to have the premises being true, and yet the conclusion can be true with it. If you do that, there will be tension. So you can say, all women like banana. My mother, oh, my mother is a woman. Yes, you don't want to conclude that, then she too likes banana. You said all women like bananas. You admit that your mother is a woman. What is the conclusion then? Validly. It means then that she too, like all women, likes bananas. That is deduction. And I think now the point is well made. Just to remind you of what we did a moment ago, for induction, you could accept all the premises to be true and yet deny the conclusion that comes with it and say, oh, even if it were true that most women like banana and my mother is a woman. It doesn't necessarily mean that my mother likes banana, and we saw why. Because most need not necessarily mean all. It may be highly probable, but it is not certainly so. There we go. I introduced it certainty. So deduction has certainty attached to it, especially when it is done validly. It has to be certainly true. It is a proof, P-R-O-O-F, because the premises already contain the conclusion. So the conclusion follows necessarily, the word necessarily is certainly, surely, without fail, it follows from the premise. That's deduction. That's certainty. Remember, it is purely the form that we are concerned with. Not the subject matter of it, okay? But when you come to induction, I and in induction, it is not a question of certainty. It's a question of what? Probability, degree of likelihood. So if most women, again, to my very simple 
not too complex example, intentionally so, to help you understand the look. If most Ghanaians are hospitable, and my mother is a Ghanaian, then this is the better conclusion to draw. Then she is likely also what? Hospitable. That is different from what is on the screen. If I say, oh, then my mother, then my mother too is likely hmm, hospitable. Or oh, chances are that chances, probability will never be equal to one. You, the mathematicians amongst us, you know that. It's never a certainty. It can be 99.9999999999999%. It is still probable. It could fail, so to speak. Okay, so roll back. So whereas deduction deals with certainty of its conclusions, so far as it has been validly done, okay? Induction deals with degrees of likelihood or what? Probability or chance. So for this, our example, because I said most, then there is a high chance that mommy will also be hospital, but it is a chance, probability, not a certainty. So this one, you are highly confirming the probability that she is also hospital. See how I'm speaking slowly and picking the words one, one, because you have to take note of what I am saying, not what you think. The language matters. So confirmation is not proof. Probability is not certainty. Deduction validly done is a question of certainty. Else you create a contradiction. Induction, even where you have given good reason, it's still a matter of probability. So what? It is a confirmation, not a proof. Any questions? Now, when Madam read the correct distinction, I'll take the questions if there are. I see hands up, don't worry. When Madam read the correct distinction, don't forget it because some have wrongly, and I see it on our screen, we will be shocked how much you have covered so far. Some have wrongly contrasted deduction from induction. And they were also experts. That is why when we get to informal fallacies, you will see we critique appealing just to experts because they can fail. It's a human enterprise. So have reason beyond just the experts said so. Now the annoying thing is sometimes people don't even appeal to the experts or the authority in the field in question. That one is so irritating to the, to the letter. So we'll see those later. But I'm saying that at least so-called experts in court, okay, had some wrong way of distinguishing deduction from induction. And so just so you have a picture of it, imagine I asked how do you just differentiate a man from a woman? Someone says, oh, men have short hair, and women have long hair. You remember I said that, see, I've repeated it in lecture two or so. Now you can connect those examples. That is not a clear way of distinguishing a male from a female or a man from a woman. At least that is easily accessible to us. You can use long hair and short hair. Because that is ambiguous. Now you understand ambiguity. We have done it. That one is not exactly straightforward. It could mean this and it could mean that. So you could have a woman who keeps her hair short and beautiful. Would be for health reasons, for aesthetic reasons, for economy. You brush your hair and you are off. Somebody too is sitting at the shop. They, they are pulling right, left, up, down. Six hours, she can't get up. It's getting heartache. <laughs> So some, for many reasons, some wear short hair, and she's a woman, beautiful, glorified. Others don't. So now that you are distinguishing man from woman with long hair, 
how will you clearly unambiguously do the job? This is the challenge. So that something like that is what happens when someone wants to distinguish deduction from induction the way it has been done in certain texts. And I would want one of you to read just so we know that you can't do it that way. Let me have, thank you very much, uh, my lady Beva. I think I can have. Doctor. Uh, yes, my lady. Christodia. Christodia, read for me. I can't see your screen. You can't Hello. see my screen. Let's take, let's take someone who can see this. Okay. So I'll take someone. Uh, Joanna, Edu, can you see clearly? Joanna, dear. Yes. Yes, please. Go ahead, Joanna. Thank I you. Please read for me. It is, it is wrong to say deductive arguments move from general premises to particular conclusions, while inductive arguments move from particular premises to general conclusions. That is ambiguous. Very good. Well read. Now, let's explain. Some people want to make the distinction between the two. All they say is, I, I want to believe that by now, the generality of all groups, not just the groups I, I teach directly, but all the groups in the course would know that the way this examiner asks questions, of course, with the help of police, but the kinds of questions they ask, it's not too poor pass and forget. <laughs> the questions are applied. We apply them because we want you to use them that you and think and reflect. And those who really engage content, you see that they like questions like that because you're able to write out the view, not uh, 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 what are the two parts of uh, definition, definition, definition. No, no, that's class one. Uh, Montessori, but they can be KG2. You are university. The whole world is out there, especially when you get to university and they can't hold there. Then the expectations of you is like you have to have solutions to everything. Now haircut, left, right, and all that. Because the kind of training you have, if you get a prefix, doctor, this professor, that you are in, you have to solve problems. <laughs> From religion to culture to what have you. So the post train has to be right if you are engaging tertiary education. And I'm glad that we have a, a, a couple of students that are open to that. So I want you to see, because just this slide, I can do about 10 essays from here. You have already seen some two topics, in fact, substantively one topic. So the essays, and I'm reading some and they are intriguing. So I think we are, we are doing a good job. Let's help ourselves. Take note. The person's argument is that deductive arguments would always move from general premises and then arrive at what particular conclusion. Because I showed you general claims, generalizations. I even told you that the one that Favor pointed out earlier is a universal generalization. All students I take exam, if you remember, we didn't leave out any student. Potentially, even great grandchildren that are yet to be born who grow up and become children and go to school and become students are all included. I'm talking about them, they are not even born. It has a sense of infinity, infinite reference class. I told you that. So this person speaking here, who we are saying are making the difference between deduction and induction wrongly. What are they doing? They are saying, oh, whenever you have an, an, an argument, that is a deduction. What really is happening there is that we started arguing from premises that are general. And you are concluding with what? A particular. That means the reference class now is no longer all this, that is, is particular. And to an extent, that looks like it's fine. Just like normally or generally, you would think that ladies will have their hair long and guys will have their short. But the Jesus model that we saw in pictures had long hair. So because there's that spot, that there's that possibility, you cannot tell. Anyone you are teaching deduction and induction that 
the correct distinction between deductive argument and deductive argument is that deduction moves from general premises to particular conclusion, whilst induction starts from particular premises to general conclusion. That can be true in some cases, but it is ambiguous because there are other instances you can have a deduction, but there wasn't even a movement from general to particular at all. So let me give you an example. Kofi is taller than Kwame. That's my first premise. Kwame too is taller than Kojo. I said, I want to say it again, then you yourself will give me the conclusion, which follows deductively. Kofi is taller than Kwame. That's my first statement, evidence that I gave my premise. Kofi taller than Kwame. Then I tell you, Kwame too is taller than Kojo. What follows necessarily from that? I want a chorus answer now. Kojo is the short. Kofi is taller than Kojo. So the first one. So the, yes. one said, oh, they didn't hear that. So the generality of the answers are correct are correct. And so just for two I won't heard it earlier. I was saying Kwame Kofi K O I Kofa. Yeah. Is taller than Kwame. And Kwame too is taller than Kojo. Then obviously Kofi will be taller than Kojo. Well, what, what is it? Hmm. The point is, if I said this beautifully, you will realize that there was no general statement. In it. No generalization whatsoever. Yet the conclusion, uh -huh. the conclusion we drew came deductively. We took it from the premises, like we took an, a, a cash from an envelope that was given to us. The conclusion is inside the we didn't force it. It is part of it already, like the pregnant woman and the baby in the tummy. As soon as we asked the premises to come in, accepted it to be true, that word, that Kofi is taller than Kwame. The second one, that word, that Kwame too is taller than Kofi. Then obviously, Kofi will be taller than Kojo. It's hypothetical syllogism of a kind, but we'll get there. I say of a kind because this is not a universal, and we have not done all that, so don't worry. It's just a relation, it's a Z pattern. But hypothetical, yeah, keep quiet, please. But hypothetical will expect that you have conditional structure. Don't worry. So, but the pattern is there. Kofi, I was saying, Kwame. Kwame, so was saying, Kwejo. And your Kofi, I was saying, Kwejo. I said the same thing I've said in English over and over again. I just did a few version of it. People, this conclusion we drew that therefore Kofi is taller than Kwejo is no magic. It's not divine inspiration. I saw into the heavenlies and the realms. No. It's granted that the premises were true. This conclusion necessarily follows it. So it is a matter of certainty insofar as we accepted the premises to be true. We cannot reject this conclusion. It comes with it. Deduction. Finito. Not a question of someone has to be general moving to particular and particular moving to that. There is not even a general statement in it. But we have arrived at a deduction, a valid conclusion taken from the premises, deduced from the premise. That is why you can't go teach it. That's one of them. There are quite a number of others. I use the relational one to show deduction. That is not moving from general to particular. Now, sometimes induction too. I am induction could move from general to particular. I'm gonna say, yeah, my lady, oh my God, I tell you, God, I know she's not in yet. I will show up. You can have a reasoning 
moving from general statement to particular statement. And yet the conclusion doesn't follow necessarily. That is why immediately after this slide, which has just diffused the so-called, this slide just diffused the movement from particular to general as a criteria, threw it out and said, do not go distinguishing a deduction from induction by talking, uh, by saying that one moves from general to particular. Because that is sorted, we'll move quickly to the next slide, which only talks about what deduction is topic neutral. And I talked about it in the introduction. So you just have to see it. And then we move on. Oh my. And then we move on. Whilst induction deals with what? Subject matter. Any question? Oh. Yes, please, I have a question. Any question? Say, go ahead. I'm sorry, because I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little with my screen. I, I couldn't move quickly. So go ahead. Uh, please, the, first, the question that you gave, Kofi is taller than Kwame, and Kwame is taller yes. than Kuju. Yes. yes. Please, can you also say Kuju is the shortest yeah. among? Okay, then that, now we'll be using uh, another term. Uh, we just wanted to repeat the pattern. The taller than, taller than. Uh -huh. That's why. But what you said, shorter than, would be the opposite of it if we're talking subject matter. Okay. So if you want oh, to do a deduction, you want to repeat the content and the language that way. When I say the content, maybe I want to see we are talking taller, taller, taller. So you want to maintain the taller so you don't create any problems for yourself. Yes, that's the only reason why. But if, if, if you could say that, then, uh, uh, excuse me, then Kojo is the shortest. Um, that would be another introduction of another concept, shorter, and not maintaining our original concept, the taller, that would be given. Okay, all right. Now, I was just telling you, I was telling the class that what follows next is just this important point to tell you that deduction is neutral to the topic as induction is focused on what the content or the subject matter. Okay, so now I can move on. I hope everyone can see my screen. Let me just be sure. Please, one or two of you. Please mute. Please mute. No one, no one, no one, no one should talk. No one should talk. Yes. Mm. Yes. Then you see that I bring everybody that the network difference and the sense of class helps. Okay, so we, we accommodate all and then we move on. We don't know, we have impact. We can't come and sit here. We are social beings. We are sitting here and talk. You are not careful. You don't see when your eyes closed behind your laptop <laughs> and you fell off your. Of the wall, I come to them to go for it. Okay, so it helps. All these help. Right. Now we want to quickly move on to our I'll stop sharing for a minute. I'm going to reshare so that those whose gadgets were dormant for a while and so went off will not be stressed on the session. Okay. So I, I'm resharing the same thing. Then we'll move on to another part of our main meal for today. Particular versus general. Why? So that we can now build on it. This one too, is very important for your understanding of Unit 7, verifiability 
confirmability, uh, uh, observation statement, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are all bordering on this discussion that we need for Unit Six to help us do modus ponens, to lens, whatever. And yet, we will also need for Unit Seven. We know its importance. We will give a lot of attention to it without getting stressed. Here we are. Understanding particular as a general statement. When you speak a statement, okay, you make a statement. In English, we will say there will be a subject and a predicate in certain instances. Kofi is a boy. Subject, Kofi. Predicate is a boy. Now, when we do critical thinking or logic, we are careful with the labeling because we are concerned about the logic of it, not sometimes, not just the English of it. So we don't want to say subject, but it is relatively like it. Okay. Oh, you. oh, you can see it now. I think it's visible now. Okay, so touch your gadget a little. What I projected is understanding particular versus general statement. No one can see that, please. Yes. It's... Please see. Yes, you can see that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Boss, so touch your thing a little. I can Just... see. That's it. You can I see. Can. It's, not... it's still not. Right. It's still not. Right. No I problem. Can. Because it's being recorded, what, not don't get yourself too worked up. Okay. Just in case for some reason the yarnum at home have been visited <laughs> and they are not allowing you to see. Won't get worked up. They are recorded. Okay. We share. <laughs> this woman bar, yes. Nancy Papa. Okay. Let's continue. I was saying that. The one that in English you would want to say is the subject of a statement is what approximately, not exactly, but approximately called by the logician as what? Reference class. So if you are making notes, it's a good time to write something down. Reference, what we are referring to. So that when I said, Kofi is a boy, you would ask me, what are you referring to or who are you referring reference? Then I'll say, I'm referring to Kofi. Then the predicate is a boy. The logician will ask you, what are you attributing to Kofi? What are you saying about Kofi? What are you imputing to Kofi? Oh, I'm saying he is a boy. Okay, so every statement like that would have a reference class. Why do we say class? Because we are talking in the collective. We don't want to talk in the particular. We are describing that office, not the person sitting there. So reference class versus what? And what attribute class? English, subject, predicate. Log logic, we may want to say something around that. Reference class, attribute class. So that man is a bully. On my screen now, please. That man is a bully. That man is the reference class. What I'm referring to, who am I referring to? I'm referring to that man, that man. Sabemaru, that man. This boy, don't The class rep. Look at this, the particularity is particular. It's not generic, it's not general, no, particular, okay? So the subject, that man, has an end. If I were counting, I'll finish. That man. I may not have said that man. I could have said those men in that room. In that room. Madam, Maybe please, I can't room. hear you. Oh dear, hold on. Eh? Let me deliver content. Don't interrupt, I beg you. Okay? I've already made a statement on that. Okay, I'll stop sharing and reshare later. But listen to the very important thing. Because the slides are there for you. Recording is here. But hear me now, okay? I said there could have been 300 million men in that building or that nation. If I said, listen, if I said, those men in that country at that time are so, so, and so, and so. 
this is finite, it has an end. It, the numbers can be counted. Which numbers am I talking about? Reference, the numbers I'm referring to in that class. So such a statement will be described as a particular statement, particularity, specificity. But the specific sometimes confuses people. When you say green tables are costly these days, like the one in the say we talk about green tables, they're specific. No, it's not, it's not specific. So let me help you with the count. Let me use countable to make you get the concept of general versus particular. Then when we build on the level of difficulty, you will see what we mean by specific, specific, okay? So how should you distinguish a particular statement from a general one? Particular statement has a finite reference class. And I say finite just means you can finish counting the reference. It may be plenty or one or two or 10, but you will finish counting there. It may be 300 million. If the way I spoke, makes it possible for you to finish counting. This is how I'm speaking that we are dealing with. That man in that room is in trouble today. I was laughing myself. That, that man. The women coming from the market through so and so uh, road have done so and so and so for women coming from that market. The reference, I don't know. It is Finite. So the, that statement is a particular statement. But if I went to say men are bullies, the earlier example was that man is a bully, specific, countable, finite. I can finish counting. I'm not speaking for men of all times, all places. That's not what I did. I, I, gave you a finite reference class, countable. So if you were to go and check, you can verify, check, take note of the language I'm using. Because if you are doing that, eh, you have finished the course and you are doing so with ease, you can easily impart it to others and apply it. This is verifiable. Why? Because I'm dealing with a reference class that is countable. So you are able to directly test it. You don't need all winding around. Now, what about the one who said men are bullies? How do you verify that? Because some men are not even yet born. I already explained. And when you say men are bullies, you are saying all men didn't qualify it. No exempt men. You and I are great, 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 great grandson. Who will come if Christ doesn't come? And 100 million years after us, it's included in this your statement you are making about they being bullies. How do we check whether the attribute applies to them also or not? Ah, but doc, I wasn't speaking about them, but that's what you said. As for men, they are not reliable. That's what I just said. In the women, if so, then they, that's how women are. Then the girl turns and asks you, that includes your mother. And you have raised pestles. I'm going to beat her. You said it, not her. Because if you say men are bullies, and so we have done all that in the past. Girls have done this. Panties are this. Politicians are that. Uh, women are just for students. That's how they are. This. My dear, how many have you made? You yourself, when were you born? <laughs> and then we all laugh about it. It is a generalization that you can't ground with certainty, but we'll get to that later. Right now we are showing you the difference between general and particular. What you can do is only look for evidence, particular instances that corroborate that your claim, that supports it. But you cannot claim you are proving it. Remember the normative versus empirical when we studied proving? You are always able to find a counterfactual. If you engage the previous content, you see how they connect, yes. So when you speak generalizations, especially the type that I have just shown up here, and I already helped you see when favor gave it after a long read. I told you that favor said, this person didn't leave anybody out. Universal, 
generalization. Law-like generalization. The law doesn't care whether you are this or that. I mean the law properly applied. That's what law means. No exemption. So this type of generalization up there, which is different from a particular statement, which we have seen, that's what doesn't even leave any member out. No exemption to the set. The reference class is not specific. It is infinite. Some of you will say, I like to say infinite or uncountable. Potentially, it doesn't end. It's like God. Eternity past, eternity present, eternity future, all in one statement. Now, when were you born? That you are saying, who oh, asked for uh, uh, Muslim, that's how they are. As for Christians, they are like this. Oh, those people from here, they are like this. When were you born? It is generic, general, and not just general, but this type of generalization, it is law like and universal. So it's a good time then, see, to tell you about the types of generalizations. Universal, the one that you are now very familiar with, whose surname is law like generalization. Look on your screen. That one, what happens there? The attribute. Have you forgotten attribute? Don't forget. I remember predicate when you are doing English. Attribute class, what you are saying about Kofi. That's what the attribute is. So we said if you have a law like or universal generalization, it just means that the attribute applies to all members of that infinite reference class in that statement. You exempted no one. Back to our that example, men are police. Very good. So we won't uh, stress that one any further. But check. You can have another type of generalization, which is not general. Excuse me, I say it's not general, which is not universal, but it is what? Statistical. That word, you have to eat biscuit in the morning before you say it. Statistical. Commandant Tomero, you know, that kind of thing. No, Brian, statistical, no, I brought for statistical generalization. Which one is that one? It means it will have an infinite reference class. No two ways about that because it's a generalization, a class that you potentially you won't ever finish counting. Like God, you will never finish putting him in a set. You want to do that? You want to make him less God? <laughs> you can't finish having all the aspects of him, that being, I worship you, Lord. You know, you won't be, don't try it. No human being can have a place in the, what? That office. And God told me that this, which we believe, God tells us this, but be careful. Uncreated creator. A being that created everything, yes, wasn't created. Does it have a beginning? And yet, you can't think of it, it, uh, his end. It is beyond us, people. Infinity. So when you speak in a certain way, you arrogate to yourself some place be like you are that. If it is just the way we are speaking, then that is what we were admonished to watch lecture one. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Or admit that this is based on what you have about this subject matter so far. And that is fine. So we are back on the statistical one. What is its nature? It's a type of generalization too. What does it say? You have made a general statement, yes, but you recognize that there are possible exceptions to the set. Some men are bullies. Most women are bullies. Two out of 10 Ghanaians live beyond 80 years. These three statements I just gave you are all generalizations. Don't be deceived. They are just general statements that make exceptions, leave out certain members of their infinite reference class from the way they are speaking. So they are more likely to be true 
than the one that says, oh, men and all oh, metals, this. anytime they this. That anytime, all this, as soon as you get just one metal, that will not expand. You have falsified the statement. So statistical generalization make room for possible exemptions, and therefore they are more likely to be true than universal generalizations. Write that thing that I just said down, put it in the corner of the fridge, the left side, don't put it in the deep freezer because you need it very soon <laughs> for unit seven. Why it is then that the scientists, the empirical scientists will rather prefer universal generalization that can easily be false. That one rather is valuable to the scientists than the statistical one, which will rather be easily true. What is wrong with the empirical scientists proper? Why? You will see the logic of that. From here, just understand that statistical generalization is make what exception to the general set. It is still general, but it makes exceptions. Therefore, the note reference class there says what? Whether you want to know if a statement is particular or general, or even with a general set, whether it is a statistical one or a low like one, it all rests on what? The reference class and whether it is countable or uncountable, whether it's finite or infinite, whether it's specific or not specific. Reference class. Some examples, then we take questions and we are done for the day. Very well done for the day. I put my answers there, unfortunately. <laughs> Maybe fortunately or unfortunately, but we'll discuss it together. So I have people read. We are practicing together. Particular statements versus general statements. And then where they are general, whether they are law-like generalizations, also called universal generalization, or they are statistical generalizations. We want to practice and see. Let me have someone read. The first one I'll read, tell me. The disease is contagious. I want someone to tell me, is that general or particular? Or maybe I should do a chorus. Okay, so let's do a chorus response. General. 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 I will check it's a particular state. It's a particular state. Okay. That is what I'm okay, let's, let's do it together. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, example one is what I'm referring to. The statement there says the disease is contagious. The disease. Sometimes you just get that. Okay. So it's not a problem. We'll wash all the things we don't know with parasol bag. And clean up our brains and then what we we'll put inside. So no problem. The disease is contagious. And this is an eye The reference class. Oh, Auntie, to stop that. What's the reference class? The disease. You see that? The disease. The disease. Yeah. Wow. That one. Okay. The that one is, what is, is, it, is it general or particular? The disease is not particular. I the commentary that the sister is Don't worry. Let's do more. That's why I have to practice. So it is particular. Okay. Very good. Now look at example three, two. It has the same thing. The liquid in that ball is poisonous. The liquid. Particular. So it has a particular liquid in mind. Can you see that? That's the point. So it's a particular. Yeah. Very good. 
Now the same is happening with example five. Yeah. Yeah. Is, see, people oh, learn different. Yeah. You don't get worked up at all, okay? People, right. everybody is different. So we will only work at trying to bring everybody along. Anka, we have finished this already. Anka, I'll, I'll be on unit eight already. Uh -huh. okay. I will help every heart. So let's go that way. Example five says, Kofi is the new SRC president. Kofi. Particular. Particular. Right. Very good. Now, th those that are yeah. contentious, yeah. Yeah. before we are ending, those that are contentious they are the example six and seven. Look at example six. And seven. So we'll trash that out and then I'll wrap up nicely for you. When we meet God willingness, we we'll continue with the unit. Okay. That's how our course outlines. You can check. Now, check everyone see. Example six says, all voters prefer. A recount of ballots. I think you've done very well. Full two hours like that on heavy content. And so this has done well. And we'll finish shaking. Six, it says all voters, all voters prefer a recount of ballots. One one what to a benyinara. What they say, yes, and to be one one what to apa. Those who vote, all voters prefer a recount of ballots. Hold on. I'm coming. Don't worry. Don't don't worry. I want you to see it. Remember, it's critical thinking. Now look at seven. Seven says all the voters interviewed said they will prefer a recount of the ballot. All the voters interviewed said they will prefer a recount of the ballot. We have a specific group of voters in mind, those that were interviewed said they will prefer a recount of the ballot. It's example seven, almost done. Almost done. Particular. So particular number seven. Particular. Particular. That's correct. So example seven is unambiguously what? Particular, it's a particular one. All the, I can count. If I wanted to count all the voters interviewed, I can count and get them. That's example seven. Example six, unfortunately, is not particular. It's speaking in the everyday terms. All voters, everyone who votes to share a recount. That is everyone who votes. Everyone for all places. All, all. That is only a generalization for, but which type of generalization is six? I want a chorus answer. That text is <laughs> all voters. It's a universal. It's universal. universal. Yeah. Yes, we haven't done statistical now. If you rush ahead, we'll be proud. Statistical is like example two. Universal. Personally, oh. uh, example two says few Ghanaians. Uh -huh. uh, let's uh, look at example 10. 80% of all retail stones, all retail stones, yet the person says 80% of those. So you will see that it will be statistical. I will take my time and help you see it. That is why you are coming for a lecture to hear it because our minds and the way we speak, Sister Joy and Briar, don't joke. Confusion, Basa. We see Mama Mutti, all the people at the back there, which people wearing suits, they are totally naked. That's how we have been speaking. We are washing it. So it's not easy like that. But we will do it patiently and slowly. So your tax now. For my groups, I, I want to share this to the other groups I teach, and then maybe the, the other groups of the course who may find it useful. And I think a lot to do. I see them. 
point of view. Go back and play everything we've said and then build on to the rest. We've done more than half the content for this, but I'll patiently go through the practice with you again. I'm going to tell the teachers to engage you in practice questions on particular versus general uh, statement and then the generalizations, the two types. Then we build on from there. And then for next week going, God will you will do the valid patterns proper. By then you will know general, particular, antecedent, consequent, universal negation, universal affirmation. So when I tell you that this reasoning is valid because it affirmed the antecedent, you don't go around, 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 around. no, it settles in nicely for you. I'll take only two questions because the time is already up, but I'll take two questions. Madam, please, can I ask a question? Head, babysitting. I don't know. Is it the link? Can... Please go ahead, sir. Um, please, I, was, I want to ask oh. the date of our RA. Go ahead, can you hear me, please? Can you hear me, please? Yes, please, I can hear you. And then, go ahead. <laughs> He's also asking the date of the IE. Ah, it's on the first outline. It is the week we can give you, the eight week. It's on the first outline. We discussed it. This is yes. week six. Uh -huh. The reason why we can't do it is 17 to 8 is because we don't decide what we invested that. Because you will come and write using the facilities of that. All those information is on the post. Uh -huh. But the investor will tell you come maybe on the weekend from so and so to so and so to it. Will be the lecture doesn't decide that. Um, so mute that thing, my friend. Mute it. Like any investment and that. Yeah. So that you can hear me. Please, we can't hear you. Well. Madam, mute everyone. Mute everyone. Come again. We can't hear. That's I'm sorry. I'll go. Madam, just mute everyone. Mute, mute, listen, listen. Let's take one, please. Let's go to the side. This is the side. Too much noise. If I do, how will I do it? Send all your questions directly to me. Shut up. I just told you that. Madam, please don't go. No, no, no. I have to attend to another class. Yeah, yeah, I'm waiting to come in. And it's some few minutes to go. But the gentleman yeah. person will call. Madam, that one. Just stop the recording. So, week eight. So you look out for a shadow that will come. And I'm just adding information that will help you in your life on Lego campus. That exams, date, and time, and venues are not determined by lectures or examiners. And it is part of the integrity of the exam. That is the reason. So the lecturer doesn't know where a student A or B will sit. The person who, uh, doing the location also doesn't know who or where anybody will sit. Days, sometimes days to the day you write the paper, you get to find out that you write so and so place, so and so place. So and so. It is part of avoiding more practices. So you know that it will be in the eight week to help your planning. You know that before that eight, and this is the sixth week, the notice will come to show the specific time you should go and sit there. But how long it will take and which type of question? Go to the course outline. Like okay, say, I think you are answered. What's the last question? I see 11 hands up. I don't think they are all questions. So I can take one more. Andy, do you have a question? Go ahead. Andy, go on. I think that if it's a bordering, a question that is really bothering you, you will send it across and I'll do my best to help you. Good job today. Well done. Engage this content before you come next week. God willing. Otherwise, 
we will have to do so much of this. But thank you all. Enjoy the session. Bye bye. 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 Love you. Bye. 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 Bye.